Hi everybody and welcome back. Today we're going to be looking into animal diversity. In this video I'm going to cover the different ways in which we um, allocate subdivisions of animals, so how we look at their symmetry, their body tissue layers and their sea limbs and then we're going to look at the specifics of the major animal groups. Now, a really important skill that you are going to need for animal diversity is to be able to read off a phylogenetic tree, which is what we have in the camera in front of you. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to zoom in on a particular part of this so that we can see a little bit closer. And basically what a phylogenetic tree is, is a timeline of how organisms have appeared. And along the way, there are different um, physical characteristics that appear. And so if we look at the very, very base of this animal diversity tree, we will see that everybody contains a multicellular common ancestor. Now that multi-common ancestor probably is something like a protist and from there outwards we have all of the animal groups that we see today. Now, what's important to understand about phylogenetic trees is that they show us common ancestors. And common ancestors are often located at these points of divergence. So there would be a common ancestor here, there would be another one over here, and so on and so forth. If we look a little bit higher, there would be a common ancestor over here, but there would also be one over here. And so essentially what you're doing is you are looking for how many common ancestors do animals have in common. The more common ancestors they share, the closer they are in relation to one another. Now, this particular phylogenetic tree is quite useful because what they have done is along each of the divides, they've told you what the animal has. So if we go back to the beginning and we look at this first common ancestor, they are saying that this particular individual splits into two possible groups one that had no tissues and one that did have tissues. The one that went with no tissues continued on this pathway, which if we look a little bit higher, you'll actually see it becomes sponges. And if we go the tissue route, there was then another point of change. This common ancestor resulted in either having radial symmetry or bilateral symmetry and so on and so forth. But how do you actually calculate how related an individual is? Well, you need to look at how many common ancestors that they have in common with one another. So if we were to zoom out a little bit and move to the higher part of this phylogenetic tree, we are going to see how many common ancestors these individuals have. So let's say, for example, the question wants to know who is more closely related. And let's say the question is, who is more closely related? Mollusks or, you know, snails and that kind of thing. And and annelids or mollusks and arthropoda. So who's more closely related to one another? So here's the thing, we need to see how many common ancestors they share. Now what you could do is you could go all the way back to the beginning of the tree and you can count how many common ancestors we share. So we have one, two, three, four, let's move this up, four, we have number five over here, and then we get to number six. Now, up until number six, everybody shares these six common ancestors out of the three uh, of the mollusks, the annelids, and the arthropods. What's important here is if you notice, at point six, we branch off into the mollusk branch. And then we also branch off to the right here, and there's another common ancestor. So this would be technically common ancestor number seven. So now that means that who has the most common ancestors shared with one another? Well, mollusks have six in common with annelids and arthropods, but annelids and arthropods have seven in common with one another. They have this extra one that happened after mollusks appeared or at least started their evolution and therefore annelids and arthropoda are more closely related to each other because they share more common ancestors. And so that's what you're going to need to do is count how many ancestors they share and the more ancestors they share, the more likely they are closer in relation to one another. 
So when classifying an organism, we need to first of all look at its symmetry because this is going to allow us to put it into one of three categories. Now, the first category that we can find in terms of symmetry is going to be something like asymmetry or in this particular picture, they just say it has no symmetry, none. Asymmetrical organisms, there is only one asymmetrical organism and that is peripheria or sponges. The second option is radially symmetrical, which means that no matter which way you cut the individual, as long as you cut it through the center, you will always have the same half on either side. And this is very clearly seen in examples like nodaria or jellyfish and um, sea anemones. The final kind that we are used to seeing is bilateral symmetry. And this is where the majority of animals on earth lie. And that is simply because if you cut them down the center of their bodies from the anterior end to the posterior end, they will make um, two identical copies or there will be two mirrored sides to each of the organism. Now, this symmetry reveals certain things about the organisms. There are certain advantages for different kinds of symmetry. So let's look at asymmetrical structures like sponges. They have a blind ending gut, which means that technically any food that goes into their body cavity actually enters through exactly the same opening. So they don't actually have a complete digestive system. They have no true tissues. They are the only one that we know of in the animal kingdom that possesses no true tissues. In actual fact, they're only made out of two cell layers. They don't actually have specific tissues. They have no coelom, which means they have no body cavity on the inside for organs to grow in and, and be independent. We'll go into more detail later of what a coelom is. And lastly, they are sessile, which means that they do not move around. And so some of these advantages is that they can grow almost anywhere in water in particular. Um, they're simple filter feeding organisms. And they lack uh, the majority of a nervous system, so they can't sense anything around them. Now, in terms of radially symmetrical organisms, we are going to see organisms that can sense in a multitude of directions. They don't necessarily have a very specialized sensory organs yet. That comes much later. But, however, they are able to search for food in all directions. Now, they are made out of tissue layers, and they have two tissue layers. We're going to get to what those are soon. They often comprise of a hydrostatic skeleton, which means that their skeleton is made out of water and that their skeleton is kept under pressure. And most organisms that are radially symmetrical actually have to live in water because their body needs to be supported by the water around them. They have no coelom either, which means they have no body cavity. And if you don't have a body cavity, you are not going to have specialized organs. And last but not least, they have a single or also what we would call a blind ending gut as well. It means the opening that goes into their body is the same opening that waste uh, would leave their body. Finally, bilateral symmetry. Now, the advantages of that is that you have something called cephalization. Cephalization essentially means that at the uh, anterior end, which is basically where the head is of an organism, you will find a cluster of sensory cells. In other words, you will find a brain. Uh, and you will have sensory organs. And it's not just limited to eyes and ears. There are many other sensory organs that other animals possess that perhaps humans don't. Another thing about uh, bilateral symmetry is that anyone who is bilateral will have three tissue layers. And because they have three tissue layers, they will have some form of coelom. In other words, they'll have a body cavity in which they can have very specialized organs that allow them to do specialized functions. Now, once we've classified our organism by their um, symmetry, we're going to look at their tissue layers. And besides sponges, sponges are the only ones who don't have uh, either diplo or triploblasts. They're just cell layers, so they don't actually have any tissues. Um, they fall into one of these two other categories. Now, as far as we are going to know, the only organism that is a diploblast is nadarians, which we'll get to soon. Diploblast means die, means two, and so that means that there are only two uh, tissue layers. And the two tissue layers that we see in diploblasts are going to be the endoderm, which is this very central layer. That is what is going to grow into the digestive system. So think the stomach, the intestines. And then the outermost layer is going to be the ectoderm, and this would grow into the skin.
But if you're a slightly more complex organism, you actually have a few more of these structures, and that's why you're called a triploblast. Triplo meaning tri, you are made out of three tissue layers. Starting yet again, you do have an endoderm because you need an endoderm to form your digestive system right in the center. And then you have a middle layer, which we call the mesoderm. Now, the mesoderm is a really important layer because that's the layer that you grow all your other organs out of. So that means that lungs, heart, liver, kidneys, they grow in this particular layer. And if you don't have this layer, you can't grow those organs, which means you're not that very complex as an organism. And then last but not least, the triploblast also has an ectoderm. And that ectoderm, like I said, grows into the skin and possibly the nervous system of that organism. Now, the one thing I didn't mention for now is this non-living layer that you may be able to find in diploblasts. And this non-living layer is sometimes what we see in organisms with high hydrostatic skeletons like nadarians, so like jellyfish, and basically it's a place for them to store water to give their body shape. Now let's look into coelom. So at this point we've classified organisms by their symmetry, and if they have bilateral symmetry they will be a triploblast. If they are a triploblast, which means they have three tissue layers, they will then have a form of a coelom. Now as we look into a more detail of the coelom, we can see that you need to know the tissue layers before you understand this next topic. And so each of these organisms has an ectoderm on the outside and it has an endoderm on the inside representing its digestive system. The other layer, the mesoderm, as you see in the pink here, is slightly differently arranged depending on which of the coelums that you have. And so as we move from left to right, I'd like you to take note of how complexities increase. In other words, if you are starting at the beginning, you have a very, very simple body plan. But as you slowly move towards coelomates and then finally, uh, sorry, pseudocoelomates and then coelomates, you'll see that the organism will become bigger and more complex. So let's start off with coelomates. An example of a coelomate would be like a flatworm. Um, and these flatworms, which we'll speak about later, they're very, very simple organisms. And you'll notice that their tissue layers are somewhat solid. There's no empty spaces in between them. Until we get to the digestive cavity in the middle, that's the only hollow space. And so what that means is, is that any organs they do grow are within these actual tissues. And so they will sit in this space. And what that means is, is that um, the organ itself actually runs through the entire organism. It's not necessarily separate from other organs organs. If we look at pseudocoelomates, an example of these could be roundworms. Some roundworms we're familiar with would be like parasitic ones that perhaps lift, live inside your digestive system. They're a little bit more complex because now what you find is they have a pseudocoelomate. And so what that means is they have this empty space over here, which is a cavity. It's basically an empty space that you can put organs inside of it. But these organs are not very complex because, unfortunately, they can move around a lot on the inside. They're not very stable and they might be repeated throughout the organism as well. But we are getting a little bit more specialized. The organs are definitely getting a, a, a better, higher, more complex function. But the final picture in the story is going to be coelomates. And this is where the majority of organisms or, or animals actually lie. And you'll notice that they also have, yet again, an ectoderm and an endoderm with the mesoderm. But you'll notice that the mesoderm actually sits uh, almost like an outer ring and then an inner ring. So if this over here is the outer ring, ring and here is the inner ring, what it does is it provides this C-shaped or this semicircular space on either side. And why is that important? What function would that hold? Well, it's important for it to be there because that is where we are actually going to grow our organs and not just grow them. We're going to keep them separate from each other. They are going to uh, be independent and they're going to function independently of one another. And why is that so important? Because if organs are separate from each other, they can grow bigger, 
they can be more complex and specialized, which means that they can do functions that are a lot harder for organisms that don't have this. Now, if it's difficult to imagine what this is like, you need to imagine the inside of your body being like a, a lunchbox. And inside of a lunchbox, you have um, sections that have been divided by plastic on the inside. And then I want you to imagine your organs being like pieces of your lunch, like a sandwich or a piece of fruit. And they're going to be separated from one another with cling film. So you're going to individually wrap the organs. You're going to place them in the cavities of the lunchbox. And then you're going to put the lid on top. And that's basically how the inside of the body is structured, where you have these individual cavities with individual organs. So what is the advantage of having a coelom? Well, the first of all uh, thing is that you need to know that our organs are going to slowly get bigger. And that makes sense because as the organs get bigger, the organism actually gets bigger as well because it means that there are more complex reactions that can take place, which then leads me to the fact that our organs grow independently of one another. And what that means is um, the heart can grow separately from the lungs. They're not like attached to one another. It's not like as the heart gets bigger, the lungs get bigger. They can do their own thing. They can repair themselves separately of one another. And another thing is that we can also have more complex digestion, which means that there's a bigger range of foods that can be eaten, which is a great advantage, because what it means is, is that if one food is missing, you can go out and find something else that's similar and still get the same nutritional value. And if you can eat more foods, it also means that you can actually live in more places. It means that you are adapted to suit more than one environment, which makes you a lot more successful. The first of the animal phyla we're going to look into is periphery. And periphery are also known as sponges. And sponges come in a variety of places, um, particularly in aquatic environments, uh, freshwater and saltwater. And um, they are our simplest and oldest animal, and they have been very unchanged for a very long time. It's important to know that they do not move. So they are sessile, which means that they are stuck to whatever they are growing on. In this photograph here, we can see they're growing on a rock alongside also with some coral sitting in the center here. And we'll get to coral soon. What's really important about periphery is that they are two cell layers thick. They are not two tissues layer thick. Um, and that's a really important one. That's one that a lot of people get wrong um, in tests and exams. Um, they confuse um, cell layers with tissue layers. Remember, cells and tissues are not the same thing. And finally, we know that periphery are filter feeders. And essentially what that means is they pull water in through these little pores, so these holes on the side. So they suck water in, they filter feed, um, and they have these cells on the inside that trap the food. And then any excess water with any food particles they don't want or any wastes will come out of the top of these holes. So that's the opening out the top where we have um, any waste products. And this is also why they don't actually have what we'd call um, a gut um, because they simply just feed through the openings on the sides of their body. So we wouldn't even call it a blind ending gut, although um, some textbooks do refer to them as that because they only have one way in and the same way out. Um, just depends on the textbook that you have. The next phyla we're going to look at is nodaria. Now, nodaria come in a multitude of varieties. The some that we are familiar with are jellyfish, corals, like you can see in the photograph alongside, and sea anemones. And what a lot of people don't realize when they look at coral, like in the photograph alongside, is that this entire structure is a collection of nodarians living together. And so what we can't see in this picture, but if you were to zoom up a little bit closer, on each of these little spikes, you can see there's these tiny little bumps. And each one of those little bumps is an individual nodarian polyp. And I'm going to go through the different body structures that they come in very soon. But that links to my next point in that they are aquatic and they live with two different body forms. And now these two body forms that they have have um, either been a medusa or a polyp. I'm going to go through what those are in the next slide. 
They are diploblastic, so they've got two tissue layers. They have two true tissue layers. They have a hydrostatic skeleton, some of them do, whereas, for example, our coral alongside here actually just uses a, a, a calcium um, compound in order to grow themselves on top of it. That's what makes coral hard. Um, that's often why people think that coral is actually not alive, but it is. And the most defining thing that Nadaria have is they have something called a nematocyte, which are stinging cells. And we're very familiar with these in jellyfish. And um, these are the cells that uh, sting you um, if a jellyfish tentacles touch you. But coral and anemone an also have these stinging cells. Essentially, the cell is sort of a rectangular shape, and sitting inside of it is a spring like um, tail with a barbed. Uh, very sharp um, sort of pointy end to it and basically this very sharp structure will shoot out of the cell so if this is what the cell looks like and this is what it looks like when it shoots out basically what happens is because it's barbed it means that these little ends so I'm talking about these little ends over here, because they points, they point inwards like that. What happens is, is that when they go into your skin, they can't be pulled out because then the barbs flare outwards and it's very painful. And so that's also why you also experience some pain when you're stung by jellyfish is that those barbs get stuck in your skin and often many of them have some kind of toxin in them. That's what the Darians use to catch fish and um, what they feed off of. Um, they basically sting their prey in order to kill them. Now, as I said before, um, Nadarians come in two body forms. And so the two body forms that they come in are either going to be the polyp form, which is what we see most coral and anemones. And if you see a jellyfish, it's in the medusa phase. But what you'll notice is that these arrows indicate that they can actually swap between the two phases. And that's actually very true. The weird thing about Nadarians is that we don't really know how long some of them last for, because what they're actually doing is when they go in between these two body forms, they're going from a juvenile, which is dev, just generally what the polyp is. It's a, it's a juvenile nadarian. And they become a medusa and they can swim around and move around. And so, for example, a baby jellyfish will be a polyp. It will then grow into a medusa. But here's the weird part. That adult jellyfish can revert itself, a group of its cells, and go back into being a polyp, and it can essentially live forever. And in some instances, we don't know how long jellyfish actually live for because they can do this. Now, that doesn't mean that all Nadarians can do this. And that is also why when you look at um, coral, coral is permanently in the polyp stage. It's not moving around. And you just have to imagine it being like an upside down jellyfish. It's got all of its tentacles floating out towards the outside of the body because that's where the fish are going to be swimming. It's got its mouth in the center. And you'll also notice that it's got its um, gastrointestinal cavity sitting in the middle here. And so what that means is food can come in here, but it also means that food is going to exit out the same place, which means that it's a blind ending gut. It means its mouth and its anus are technically the same place. Now, because it is a triplo, uh, a diploblast, excuse me, it's got two tissue layers, it's got an ectoderm and an endoderm, it doesn't actually have a mesoderm. What it does have, however, is something called a mesogly. And if you remember way back at the first slide, I spoke about this like non-living like layer that some organisms have that are diploblastic. This is the non-living layer. The mesogly is a gelish layer that's filled with a gel and it keeps the body shape of our nadarians in place and gives them structure. The next phylum is Platyhelminthes. Now, this is the most unusual phylum only because it has a mixture of strange characteristics that doesn't make it as complex as its roundworm um, and annelid uh, cousins, other worms, but it doesn't also make it as simple as perhaps a jellyfish nadarians. And so they have some characteristics, but they lack others. Now, an example of uh, platyhelminthes are most commonly flatworms, and flatworms are free-living worms that live mostly in aquatic environments, so saltwater and freshwater. And what's unusual about them is they have some complex 
aspects to them, but also some not so complex things, which is what puts them sort of in the middle of all the phyla. And they do have a single gut, which means that the structure they feed with is also the structure that they will remove solid wastes with. So it's the same opening. They are free living, which means that they can live out in the wild. Um, they don't need to like live with other organisms. Um, these examples along in the picture here are sea uh, flatworms, so you would find these in the ocean. Um, but some of them are actually parasites, which means that they may actually live inside of you. Um, an example of this would be a tapeworm. Now, this is the unusual part. So platyhelminthes have a single gut, which means they don't have a very complex um, body structure, but they have cephalization which means that they have a anterior end if you remember it's the it's the where the head would be and that means they actually have a cluster of specialist sensing cells um, they have a very very basic nervous system with a very very simple brain we don't want to really call it brain at this point because that's not what it is in terms of their tissue layers they do have three tissue layers and that then means that they have some form of uh, or may have some kind of coelomate but because they don't have um, any space in between their layers their tissue layers we call them acelomates as we've mentioned before in our previous slide now, a step up from our platyhelminthes is Annelida. And Annelida are our segmented worms. Um, examples of these can be earthworms that we're familiar with and also leeches with their many others. And now we've got slightly more complex. We're now getting closer to organisms we're more familiar with. Now, Annelida are well known for having hydrostatic skeletons. Because of their hydrostatic skeletons, they also need to be very careful with their water and they need moisture to live. Often you will find that a lot of these annelida live in wet aquatic environments, but some of them, for example, like earthworms, they live in soil, but the soil actually needs to be damp. Um, and the reason for that also is because a lot of annelida, they breathe through their skin. They don't actually have lungs. Um, and so moisture is really important for gaseous exchange. Now, they are triploblastic which means they have three tissue layers. And because of that, it also means that they do have a coelom. Remember, that means they have a cavity where they can have lots of specialized, well-developed organs. And the last component is that they do have cephalization. Um, think of it like this. The more complex your organs are, the more likely it is that you will have a brain and you will have specialized sensory organs. The less likely your organs are specialized, the less likely it is that you will have a brain. And so cephalization essentially means that there is an, an end, a head and a tail to the organism, and the head has the majority of the sensory organs in it, which in annelids they do, and it's fairly well developed. The second last phyla we're going to look at is arthropoda. And arthropoda are, yet again, one step closer to being a more complex organism. They are actually very complex because they share a lot of characteristics that our own animal group have. And examples of arthropoda are insects, spiders, and crabs. And what makes them so defining is their exoskeleton. And remember, that's this hard um, structure on the outside that provides them with protection. It also means that they have to shed their exoskeleton once a year. It means they have to molt. Um, and that's because um, their skeleton doesn't grow with them. In other words, they outgrow their exoskeleton every year um, and they have to grow a new one. Now, um, arthropods are the most successful organisms on Earth. They live in every environment. They have managed to live everywhere from the ocean to soil to um, rainforest, sky. It doesn't matter. They literally live anywhere and they are so successful because they can avoid dehydration. And remember, even in extreme cold and extreme heat, there is still a lack of water or liquid water available. And arthropods are really good at living in places without any water. Now they are triploblastic, so they have three tissue layers, which means they have a coelom. And that comes along with having cephalization. And we can, we can imagine cephalization a bit better in arthropods because we can actually see their head with their eyes and their antenna. And that makes them uh, the second most complex group that we're going to look at. 
Last but not least, we have Chordata. And this is the group that we fall into. It's the most complex organism. It's also the phylum that has the largest organisms as well. And that's because... Um, as you grow bigger, you need more complex organs. And so they go hand in hand with one another. And so who falls into this category? Well, some examples are bird, fish, and mammals. And the defining characteristic of chordates is that they have an endoskeleton, which means their skeleton is on the inside and it's made out of either bone or cartilage. The second thing that's really defining is that we have a spinal cord and that spinal cord runs along the dorsal side of our body. In other words, along our back. Um, and you can see this in birds, fish, reptiles, the vertebral column with the the spinal cord on the inside runs along the back part of us. Now, this means that we actually have advanced cephalization. It means that we have the most well-developed sensory organs, the most well-developed brains as well. Most of us have uh, around four appendages, and so that means we're actually sort of segmented as well, just like we have segments in worms and we have segments in um, insects. Humans and other animals are also segmented, and we've got sections to our body, so our abdomen, our thorax, our arms and legs are, are technically segments of one another, so we have at least four appendages. Um, we are also triploblastic, so we've got three tissue layers, and because we have three tissue layers, we have a true coelom. And um, that then means that our organs can be very well developed and that we can be very, very well specialized. Now, normally at this point of the video, I would be doing a terminology recap, but there is an enormous amount of terminology in this subject, um, in this specific topic. So what I suggest is going back, having a look at the specific screenshots of each one um, and, you know, taking record of all of the words we've gone through. There's also a lot of repetition of each of the words that I've gone through. Um, and so to be successful at this specific topic, you need to be really well versed in your terminology. You need to understand how to use it correctly. I hope this video has been helpful to you today and that you use it for your revision and I will see you all again soon. Bye!